Well, let's go ahead and continue this evening in the book of John, that 14th chapter that we have spent a couple of Wednesday evenings in. John chapter 14. We will look again at verse 1. And start there. We'll read through these first six verses tonight. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And do you know the way where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, as we started out in the study, we recognized here in verse 1 that the very first statement Jesus said to them was part of a command, a threefold command that he is going to give them here. But the very first one is, do not let your heart be troubled. And that phrase comes in the light of what he just said to Peter about Peter's denial. In addition to Peter's denial, he says in the conversation that transpires between chapter 14 and 17 that all of the disciples would forsake him, that living in the day after his departure and going into heaven, that they would suffer persecution, that they would in addition to suffering the persecution, they would be called to preach the truth of Christ to the world and the world would not listen to them and would hate them and there would be those in the world who in killing those disciples would think that they are actually serving God's purpose. And Jesus admitted right up front to these disciples through this conversation that the words that he spoke to them would be troubling to them and they would be grieved over it and they indeed were. Not only that, they were perplexed over the words as we saw, but to that, Christ now says in chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. And we saw in that statement and command to them that they are responsible for their heart. And it's continuing, as we saw it in the Greek there, to be troubled. They have not only the responsibility to not allow it to continue to be troubled, but they also, as implied by the command, they have the ability. So it's not something they're called to do and are unable to do it. They can control their heart. And in addition to that, that text gives us hope because with the command and the responsibility and the ability, there is also indicated in it the fact that our hearts don't have to be continually to be troubled. There's hope in the midst of it. And then he began to demonstrate how in this very statement and also with the command that we can take control of our heart. And notice what he said. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And basically, uh, again, the idea of belief is synonymous here with faith. And we are to continue in the faith, in believing in Christ, believing in the Father. And biblical aspect of faith is obedience. Faith in God, and in particular in His Word, and that's the only way we're going to be able to have faith in Christ and faith in the Father is by having faith in what they have said in the Word. And so our faith has, as we have talked before and are really aware of, our faith has a body of doctrine. It has an object. It's God's written Word to us. And we spent some time last week bringing that out in 14, chapter 14, 15, and 16. And now this evening, we're coming to verse 2. And 
in this particular section of his encouragement and comfort for them, he calls these disciples and illustrates for them the importance of developing an eternal perspective in their lives. Notice what he said. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. First of all, it's vital that we recognize that without faith, without biblical faith, it's impossible to have a true eternal perspective, to have understanding of heaven. Now, how do we know that? Is there a particular text of Scripture that immediately comes to mind? Let me give you a couple of them. Go back in John to chapter 3. For one, John chapter 3 and verse 3. Early on in his ministry, Jesus made that truth very evident. Truly, truly, in verse 3, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot what? He can't see the kingdom of God. He cannot perceive the kingdom of God. Now, we're not talking about when it comes to heaven, being aware or not aware of heaven necessarily existing, but existing in God's terms, in God's description, in reality of the existence of heaven. Those who are lost may speak of heaven. They may speak of angels, but to have a genuine understanding of it, to be able to grasp the truths of it and the reality of it is impossible apart from biblical faith and obedience, apart from being born again. Take a look at it again, a similar statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And there to verse uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. So, apart from knowing God's truth and obeying it, which is biblical faith, Christ's statements regarding heaven inevitably fall on deaf ears. Jesus, as he speaks about this, and go back over to John 14 with me. In John 14, notice again, Jesus said, if it were not so, that is basically, if in the Father's house there were not many dwelling places, if it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus not only stresses in that verse, and we'll come to it, the fact of heaven, but the veracity of his word regarding heaven. To the person of faith, Christ's words do not fall on deaf ears, basically. Instead, they resonate with true biblical faith, and they become instrumental in cultivating that eternal perspective in a believer's life. So, to speak of heaven in biblical terms is an encouragement for God's people. We know that's our inheritance to come. Notice Jesus said there are many dwelling places. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. The New American Standard says dwelling places. The ESV um, and the NIV say houses. And the King James, as you are aware, says mansions. And really, the, the idea here is that 
there is a place for God's people. And the intent then of Christ's words is to communicate that there is a place where you will dwell with the Father. And that's an encouragement for God's people. Take a look at a couple of Old Testament passages with me. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 8, 1 Kings 8, 27, and we'll go from here to 2 Chronicles 2, 6 and to 6, 18, where Solomon on different occasions makes a statement with regard to God and the kingdom or dwelling in a place. First Kings chapter 8. And down there to verse 27. First Kings 8, 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. From here to Second Chronicles, basically the same statement made. Second Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 6. Second Chronicles 2 and 6, But who is able to build a house for him? Referring to God. For the heavens and the highest heaven cannot contain him. So who am I that I should build a house for him except to burn incense before him? Chapter 6, verse 18. Same statement. 6, 18. But will God indeed dwell with mankind on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. But the reality of the situation is the fact that God has chosen in heaven to make manifest there some aspects of His immediate presence. And that we cannot deny. Look at Revelation with me, chapter 4. You see this a couple of times in Revelation. We'll look at one for now. Revelation chapter 4. And in Revelation 4, let's go down to verse 1. After these things I looked, Revelation 4, 1, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting on the throne was, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white remnant and golden crowns were on their heads. God was manifesting His presence to John on that throne. Move down in the chapter, or let's go to chapter 5 for a moment. I saw in the right hand of Him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is in the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him 
who sat on the throne. This lamb is Christ. And Christ is taking the scroll from the one sitting on the throne, which is and would be the Father. So the Father has manifested the reality of His immediate presence to John. And we know from Revelation 21, look with me there, to verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. That's one of the great, the greatest blessing of heaven is being in the immediate presence of God. Jesus said back there in John 14, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. If it were not so, he called the disciples to an eternal perspective. In the midst of their trials and the tribulations they faced, he started out this conversation with the importance of that heavenly perspective. And he stressed it. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. This is both a reiteration as well as an affirmation. He's stressing it. It's real. If it wasn't real, I would have told you. It's almost like saying, you know, I'm not holding this back from you. It's essential. It's important. And because it's real, I'm telling you. And then he went on to say, for I go to prepare a place for you. You know, it's interesting whenever we think of Christ going to prepare a place for us in heaven, what does that entail? And I believe there's two things essentially involved in here. First of all, we need to be prepared for heaven, don't we? We aren't getting in in the condition we're in now, are we? Does anybody really want to go to heaven in the condition we're in now? I want to go to heaven to get out of the condition I'm in now. We want to go to heaven as a whole person without sin. We want to be there in a glorified body, in a soul that will no longer be hindered by the presence of the reality of sin. And we know that that's what God is doing in our lives right now through Christ as He sanctifies us. But at the same time, Jesus is saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Heaven needs to be prepared. And how is it that heaven is prepared? Well, I, I believe that what Christ is communicating here is, and notice this, He says, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. We know that going to heaven would involve the cross for Christ. And in essence, heaven has to be prepared for us. A place has to be prepared there for us. And that place is, is obviously heaven. And the preparation of it is meeting the terms needed for us to be there. We could say that a sinner to dwell in heaven, preparations must be made. It's true that the condition of the sinner will be changed as we will have a new nature and we will be there in holiness in order for us to dwell there certain conditions in heaven must first be met. And that is the satisfaction of God's justice, 
the fulfillment of His law, propitiating our sins, propitiating His wrath, satisfying it for our sins. Jesus' words, I go to prepare a place for you, first encompasses the way of the cross because it is in that cross that heaven is satisfied and the terms of heaven are met there for us. Furthermore, His words extended to heaven itself. For there, having been resurrected from the dead, He lives forever to make intercession for His people. His very presence in heaven on our behalf is an act of intercession. Take a look with me to Hebrews 7. And there to verse 25. Therefore, He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. That does not mean Christ is in heaven constantly praying for His people. His very presence there is an intercession for them. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that He has raised us up together with Him and made us to sit together with Him in heavenly places. Then, notice what He said back in seven or chapter 14. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself. That where I am, there you may be also. One of the other blessings of heaven is being there with Christ. That where I am, there you will be also. Here is a promise of His coming. He is conveying to them the importance of looking for His return. Paul stressed that in 1 Thessalonians. Peter stressed that as he wrote again, being prepared and looking forward to the day of the coming of our Lord for His people. And we're all, those who are Christians, are all going to be in heaven. We're either going to get there by passing away here, as Paul said, to be absent from the body. He had rather that and thereof, therein be present with the Lord. To depart, he said, is gain. And he spoke of departing in Philippians and he said, departing and be with Christ. Or we will be raptured whenever Christ does come and He changes this mortal body to an immortal body. But either way, we will be with Him in heaven. It's imperative that we as Christians constantly have an eternal perspective before us. It's the characteristic of all of those who have walked by faith before us. Look at Hebrews with me for a moment. Chapter 11, verse 16. We could say from this verse that the Old Testament patriarchs had an eternal perspective. It says, but as it is, they, referring to the Old Testament patriarchs he just spoke of, immediately before this in the text, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. They had and lived by a heavenly perspective. Take a look at Job 19. Job had an eternal perspective. Job chapter 19 We know how important this perspective was to Job as he suffered a multitude of things. Chapter 19, verse 25. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, He will take His stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet 
From my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. He looked forward to the coming of Christ. He looked forward to being with God and to seeing Him. We know from Psalm 16, 11 and a multitude of other psalms that David had an eternal perspective. He said in Psalm 16, 11, that in your presence as he prayed to God is fullness of joy and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Look at Romans 8 with me. A very powerful passage text with regard to this truth in the Apostle Paul's life. He says, For I consider, in verse 18, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He had an eternal perspective. And notice what Paul did. He measured in his day-to-day living his sufferings compared to eternity. And he drew a conclusion, didn't he? They're not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Look at Ephesians with me for a moment. Chapter 2, verse 7. So that in the ages to come, speaking of Christ being seated in heaven and us there with Him in those heavenly places, so that in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In the ages to come speaks of the heavenly future. As Paul evaluated his sufferings in the light of eternity, take a look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. Notice what Paul did. In the light of his sufferings, And those ultimately ultimately in the light of heaven, he said, Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outward man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comprehension. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul lived under an eternal perspective. What a great blessing that Christ gave to these disciples. And not only in in so far as the importance of having in the midst of the perilous times they would endure an eternal perspective. Not only did Jesus direct their minds to that, but Christ himself had an eternal perspective. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 with me for a moment. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him, notice this, the joy set before Him, that's the eternal perspective, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In the midst of His suffering on the cross and the agony, he looked also to heaven for the joy that was set before him. He commanded his people to have an eternal perspective. Whenever he said in Matthew 6.33, Seek first 
the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. That involves an eternal perspective. We know that the Holy Spirit commands us to have an eternal perspective. We read in Colossians chapter 3 that we are to set our minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. And finally, I always like to address something I heard someone say one time as they were talking about Christians who had a heavenly mindset. He brought out the statement and said, they, those people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And I thought, you're not talking about Christians. Because those who are Christians who are, earth, are heavenly minded, they are of the most good in the earth. They are the most good. And you see that multiple places in Scripture. But in particular, we're studying in Colossians now. In Colossians chapter 3, in those first four verses, we're exhorted to set our minds on things above. And then immediately, the apostle goes into describing the practical living of the Christian in this life. And basically, the benefit that that has not only to that believer, but to others. So being genuinely heavenly minded is an earthly good. I think we need much more of that right now. Well, we'll stop there for tonight. Any comments or questions having looked at some of those and scanned over them briefly? John. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it ultimately it had to do with uh, just to cut the chase on it had to do with a means of developing an income, so selling, yeah. <laughs> selling the indulgences. Yes. Yeah, that I couldn't. I couldn't say. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's yeah. Yep, it's been a while. And it's a sad commentary how easily the people bought into that and believed it. Right. Yeah, he talked about departing and being with Christ. Yeah. Uh, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's
let's go ahead and we'll close. Father in heaven, we thank you for the reality of heaven, for the comfort of that truth in the hearts and minds, our hearts and minds, in the hearts and minds of all of your people. Thank you that, Lord, a multitude, an uncountable number of times that has been true in bringing your people comfort in the most perilous times, the most difficult situations. Thank you that they have longed for it and looked for it, have had an appetite for it, and that because of your grace and mercy in Christ and birthing them into your kingdom and giving them a new heart and a new mind that we may perceive it. Thank you. I pray that you would bless us with the words of our Lord and strengthen our understanding of them, that they would enrich our lives, and that for Christ's cause. In his name we pray. Amen.